Good afternoon, everybody, and apologies for this short delay. Uh, we'll be getting started with today's community conversation in just a moment. I just want to make sure that everybody has a chance to fully connect before we begin. Okay, it looks like everyone is connected. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Jeff Feldman and I'm the Director of Advocacy and Communications here at NASW New Jersey. And uh, I'm happy to be joined today by Jackie Cornell, the Executive Director of the Planned Parenthood of New Jersey Action Fund. And Jackie's going to be going through a presentation today, uh, Reproductive Health Policies and Politics, to give us an update on the reproductive health landscape in New Jersey, touch base on some of the successes that we've actually had here, and maybe some of the challenges and opportunities ahead of us. Just a reminder before we begin that we are recording this presentation and it'll be available on our YouTube channel afterwards. I'll also send a link to the slides and the recording uh, to everybody who registered for today's uh, presentation. So if you were not able to join us live, uh, hopefully you are now watching us on demand and welcome to the presentation. Uh, I'm very happy to turn things over to Jackie now. Thanks for being with us today, Jackie. Awesome. <clears throat> Thanks so much, Jeff. Excited to be here. Um, huge, uh, you know, supporter of the work that you all do and, and the critical work that, um, you know, happens in the social care space uh, now more than ever. Mental health and behavioral health are so important to the things that we're dealing with. Um, you know, sort of across the healthcare system. So um, huge kudos to, to you all and, and the work that you do every single day. Um, so as Thanks, mentioned, Jackie. I'm Jackie. Yeah, yeah. Um, so as mentioned, I'm Jackie Cornell. I'm the executive director of the Planned Parenthood Action Fund of New Jersey. Um, and my um, time today, I'm going to pull up a slide deck just to kind of walk through and, and give folks some sort of uh, parameters around things. So I will pull that up now. Um, and the deck will be available um, afterwards. So I will send it to uh, Jeff and then you can share it um, as you would like. So give me just a second to pull this up. Okay. Can everybody see that? Okay. Yep. Looks good. Great. Perfect. Okay. Um, so again, thanks so much for, for having me. I'm excited to kind of engage with you all. Um, some just quick community agreements. Um, we always like to say we assume the best of intentions, but recognize the impact of the words that we say. So I endeavor to do that and I hope all of you do as well. Um, please save your questions until the end. So grab a piece of paper, you can jot things down and then I'll do Q and A. Um, I imagine that some of your questions I might answer as we get to subsequent slides and, and content. Um, and then we'll share this uh, with you all so you can have access to it yourself. Um, I uh, am new to Planned Parenthood. I, I have joked that this is my second tour of duty. I started my career um, working at, at the time, which was a small affiliate in Trenton, New Jersey, um, as a peer-to-peer -peer sex educator when I was uh, 20 years old. Um, I stayed with Planned Parenthood for the first seven years of my career, uh, and then left to do a variety of different things, both working in state and federal government um, around healthcare more broadly, uh, as well as a bunch of political campaigns uh, in my 20s when I had a lot more energy. Um, but after the Dobbs decision, um, I had been in conversations with Planned Parenthood prior to that about coming back. Uh, and then after the Dobbs decision, it became um, just really, really pivotal and crucial for me. Um, I'm a born and raised New Jerseyan. I have lived and paid taxes here my entire life. Uh, and so I really um, take a lot of pride in, in representing our state and doing this work at what is a really unique um, and frankly unprecedented time uh, in the wake of, of the Supreme Court decision uh, last June. I'm trying to get my cursor to move, here we go. Um, so I'm gonna talk about what we've done here in New Jersey. There's been a lot of great work um, that started prior to the Dobbs decision, but has only accelerated since then. I'll talk about where we're headed, some of the things that, that we have our eyes on and are examining. Um, happy to take questions and then also including ways for you all to get involved. 
So um, just a snapshot of sort of where uh, where things have moved in New Jersey and, and showing this. Um, I'm a visual learner sometimes and love a, a good timeline because I think it can help articulate sort of the, the cadence of things as, as it unfolded. Um, advocates worked for quite a while um, to expand the scope of practice under the Board of Medical Examiners. And I'll, and I'll dive into that. I'll dive into all of these more. Um, uh, in, in a second. Uh, so that happened in November of 2021. That was years in the making um, to do that work. In January of 2022, um, we passed and signed the Freedom of Reproductive Choice Act, uh, as well as a 12-month birth control uh, piece of legislation. Um, in May, there was the Supreme Court leak of uh, what would become the Dobbs decision. Um, and I think that that was in many ways, um, you know, a sign of, of things to come. Um, it's important to note that we passed the Freedom of Reproductive Choice Act uh, long before that though, knowing that uh, the Supreme Court would be hearing a case of very uh, significance, right? And, and wanting to make sure that we were doing everything we needed to do um, in advance of that ruling, not in response to that ruling. Um, so a month later in June, the actual Dobbs decision comes out uh, and then the state does a variety of things in, in a quick flurry um, around new investments into the state budget, as well as protections uh, for patients and providers as it relates to extradition uh, to other states. Um, and then in late December, uh, and then in early January, um, we had both um, a piece of legislation to put birth control over the counter uh, be signed into law, as well as uh, the Department of Banking and Insurance mandating abortion coverage into all state regulated plans. Um, and so that's just a quick visual representation of the timeline. I wanna go into a little bit more of these specifics. Um, so the Board of Medical Examiners, the BME, um, is in many ways the regulatory arm of the Attorney General's Office and the Division of Consumer Affairs as it relates to providers and the work that they can do. Um, why we were seeking a scope, uh, an expansion of the scope of practice is, um, is multifold. Um, first and foremost, just like the rest of the healthcare system, um, provider shortages are, are real and are impacting, um, are impacting us. We are clinicians uh, at the two Planned Parenthood affiliates, uh, you know, stayed and worked through the height of the COVID uh, pandemic when it was the scariest um, and were really, I think, um, leaned into the space that we occupy as the provider, uh, often for people of last resort. So we serve some of the most vulnerable people in the in the state, um, over 70% of whom are on Medicaid. Um, and so during the COVID time, um, we experienced you know, the, the same stressors in many ways that other healthcare providers did. Um, and as a result, you know, have also dealt with provider shortages. Um, there is also an increased need um, for abortion care. Um, and this was even prior to the Dobbs decision. So that was the sort of the two prong uh, approach that we took. Um, the Board of Medical Examiners also removed um, unnecessary restrictions on the physicality, on what types of facilities physically um, can provide abortion care. And so the, these were um, really helpful in, again, direct access for patients. The Freedom of Reproductive Choice Act is sort of our landmark uh, legislation in that it codifies the existing New Jersey case law into statute that protects abortion access, uh, excuse me, abortion rights. So New Jerseyans have the right to an abortion um, through uh, almost three decades of case law. And then what the Freedom of Reproductive Choice Act did was to take that case law and then embed it into statute, um, which is just another strong protection. Um, again, and this was done knowing that the Supreme Court would be hearing a case that could impact Roe v. Wade. And so this push, um, you know, started months earlier um, and happened in the final days of the lame duck legislature. Um, you know, from the 2021 elections. Uh, so happens in early January of 2022. What it also does, in addition to codifying case laws, it, it 
um, directs the Department of Banking and Insurance to study the impacts of uh, insurance coverage for abortion. Uh, and in doing so, we'll talk later on about what the Dobie report found and, and what its recommendations were. But it was important that it not only um, targeted the right to an abortion, but also insurance coverage, which um, for many folks is, is really pivotal and really key. So in the state fiscal year 2023 budget, remember budget season wraps up the end of June, budgets have to be finalized before July 1. The Dobbs decision happens on June 26th, I believe. And so we are talking like the final, final hours of a very long multi-month budget campaign. Um, the administration and the legislature work together to do um, some really important investments. First and foremost, they increase the line item for family planning funding. So family planning funding um, is the allocation that um, both Planned Parenthood, federally qualified health centers, many county health departments um, receive these funds to provide family planning services for um, vulnerable populations. Um, so there's an increase to that line item. Um, folks may recall that during the Chris Christie administration, that line item was vetoed from the budget for all eight years of, of his tenure uh, as governor. And so this was a line that Governor Murphy reinstated um, upon entering office. Um, and then this was in 2023, the first real significant bump um, since restoring those funds. Um, what the state also did in that process uh, is allocate an additional $20 million to three new grant programs. Um, the first of which was a security grant. Uh, the second was a training grant. And the third were grants for facilities. Um, the facilities piece in particular, in many ways, sort of fills the gap that was created during the Christie administration, because when dollars are short and um, agencies are trying to think strategically about how to you know, continue to serve uh, patients without these state investments. It was things like um, painting and, and uh, sprucing up waiting rooms, installing new uh, HVAC systems, um, you know, buying new uh, equipment in terms of um, you know, different clinical equipment that we could use a refresh of. So there was a variety of different things that had been put sort of on the back burner during those Christie years. Um, and these facilities dollars in many ways are, are helping to address uh, that gap in, in uh, state funds. Uh, security dollars are always of paramount importance. Every year Planned Parenthood clinics around the country unfortunately receive threats, intimidation, um, a variety of different things to impact uh, us providing services. And so these dollars are, um, again, very important given the increased uh, security risks that, that present to, to our facilities. Um, last year, um, Planned Parenthood actually lost a lease um, of a space we had hold, held for over 30 years in New Brunswick uh, due to protest activity. Um, this was a building that we did not own. And so every time the police came out to address the protesters who were um, blocking the sidewalk, blocking traffic, um, you know, being a real sort of um, uh, a risk in terms of just public safety, um, the landlord would get called and, and eventually what happened is the landlord, a new landlord came in and then they decided that they were no longer willing to deal with, you know, sort of the, the brouhaha that is created by these protesters and the work that happens. And so when we think about how much uh, these funds, you know, are how, how much they're needed, um, the protest activity has very real ramifications for us being able to provide care um, as it relates to our health centers. And so this is really important. And then the training dollars um, are designed to support clinicians entering the family planning and abortion health care uh, you know, service industry. And so how do we bring more and more folks into providing those care, in, into that providing that care, um, whether they are new clinicians, um, sort of at the beginning of their service, 
or they are established clinicians that now through the BME changes um, are able to perform abortions. And so how do we train those folks up? Um, and realizing that that training may look very, very different from an individual who has been practicing uh, and in service for years versus somebody who is just beginning their clinical and, and field experiences um, and just familiarity um, with, with doing this work. And so really pivotal, important funding opportunities uh, that came up. In the wake of the Dobbs decision, um, the state also passes legislation that uh, works to address extradition protections. Um, for providers and and essentially this means that provider records uh, can't be used in out of uh, interstate or uh, states not of New Jersey's own choosing so a, a law officer or um, excuse me a, <laughs> an officer or a legal expert in Texas can't come in and pull New Jersey records from a New Jersey patient um, or engage in trying to extradite a provider, um, for performing an abortion on someone who is from Texas. And so it's these protections that we are seeing now uh, really come to pass. Um, there was just a case uh, brought forward into the press uh, a couple of days ago where an ex-husband is suing um, his ex-wife as well as three of her friends um, for helping her self-administer an abortion. And so making sure that New Jersey providers are protected from, from cases like that or from suits like that was really important. Um, and then the same thing applies to the patients. Um, so we've ensured that uh, patient files cannot be sent over um, or cannot be sent to states who are trying to um, you know, make a case against uh, an individual. Um, this is something, the privacy around this work uh, is something that continues to, to unfold, you know, sort of every day. Uh, just this week, and this isn't even in this slide deck, uh, our Attorney General Matt Placken was on the record uh, with Bloomberg News talking about Apple's um, lack of engagement around their privacy standards as it relates to menstrual um, menstrual tracking apps. So apps that are tracking your period and different things. Um, and so we're seeing the attorney general continue to push on these privacy issues as it relates to patients. Um, and the Apple one in particular has national consequences because obviously Apple's privacy standards uh, and the way that your phone essentially you know, and your apps track all of this information doesn't change if you should live in Texas versus you live in New Jersey. And so um, I want to hold up the fact that we have folks, uh, you know, in the administration who are thinking really creatively about how can these laws that we passed here, how can we sort of uh, work to create as much national impact um, in some of the ways that data is shared and 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 privacy could be eroded and and the apple uh engagement as it relates to menstruation apps is a, is a really interesting dynamic right because it would it would essentially say in order to be compliant in new jersey you must do x y and z but that also means that x y and z falls for the entire country and so um in many ways this moment in time around data privacy um, is is fairly unprecedented um, because of the just large um, the the volume of places and engagements that people have as it relates to tracking their period. Uh, I'm sure every single person uh, who has a uterus on this call or on the Zoom um, has filled out a form at a doctor's office that says what's the last date of your menstrual cycle. Um, and so now that information can be used in really nefarious ways, depending on the state in which you live. And so this is just a really fascinating and, and um, again, unprecedented time to be dealing with privacy issues as it, as it relates to period tracking. Um, so again, uh, I highlighted before that the Department of Banking and Insurance was, was tasked with doing the study in the Freedom of Reproductive Choice Act. They release it in late November of 2021. 
two, um, and then they implement rules uh, in very quick order to ensure that abortion care is included in um, all in, uh, all state managed insurance plans. And so um, this is, you know, somewhat complicated, but I'm sure folks on this call know the the balances and the differences between which uh, how the state can and can't regulate things, right? And so. Uh, being an ERISA state and the provisions that we have um, are prescriptive to the way that New Jerseyans who get their health insurance through a New Jersey employer or through a New Jersey um, marketplace plan and the like, um, how those things all shake out. I think one of the forever problems that exist in this insurance mandate um, mind uh, uh, insurance mandate um, methodology is that there are many folks who, while they live and physically work in New Jersey, their employers are based elsewhere. And so um, we see these sorts of uh, push and pulls with, with a variety of things, um, you know, autism screening and care, mammogram coverage, fertility coverage, you name it. So one of the things that, um, you know, we continue to explore is what kind of protections can we offer for individuals whose plans are not mandated uh, or, or regulated by the state because they're not state-based plans. And this is, um, you know, something that I think we will continue to to evolve and, and look at, but it is not just a reproductive health issue. It's, you know, a, sort of a health insurance issue more broadly. Um, we then, sorry, my is frozen here. Here we go. Um, we also work to expand birth control access, um, which is really important as over 45% of pregnancies in New Jersey are unintended. And so the more that we can do to stop unintended pregnancies, the better. Um, the first of which is allowing for 12 months of birth control to be dispensed at one time. So you no longer have to go um, to both your, your clinician as well as your pharmacist to get your year's supply of birth control. So now um, you are able to get a prescription for 12 months and you are able to get all 12 pill packs, um, which for many individuals who are juggling you know, work, life, family, all of that, um, that's a real uh, access, you know, uh, an improvement on access. The other program uh, that was just signed into law in early January of this year is that now pharmacists can prescribe birth control without the patient going to the clinician first. And so that is a brand new program. Um, there's not a lot of uh, specificity out on it yet because um, Board of Pharmacy is still working through it with, with Department of Health. And um, we are excited to see how that unfolds. Uh, again, this would allow for increased access uh, for many individuals. So a bit about where we're going. Um, right now, uh, you know, sort of February of 23, um, we had the budget address. Um, I'll talk about the Mifepristone case that is now uh, coming into March. Um, we obviously have, have he budget hearings. Um, and then in June, we're preparing for the one-year anniversary of, of the Dobbs decision, as well as the budget being finalized and the primary elections happening in June. So very, very busy uh, period of time there. Um, and then in November, we will have state elections. So the mifa Pristone case is something that is um, happening right now. Um, <laughs> actually, as we are speaking, um, engagement, um, and uh, hearings uh, happening on a case that was brought in Texas um, to address the legitimacy of the FDA approving mifepristone. Mifepristone is one of two medications used in a medication abortion, um, and it has been on the market for um, over 20 years. Um, the case is against the FDA and the claims are that the FDA went through an unfair or a illegitimate process to approve mifepristone to be on the market, um, despite the fact that the uh, process has been audited by independent federal investigators multiple times. And so one of the unfortunate realities of this moment is sort of the... Um, the facts are facts if you believe them, right? There's a, a sub, sort of subjective nature of what is truthful and what isn't. 
And if you look at the merits of the case, most people agree that, well, wait, here is a very well detailed um, process of audits that were happening that that articulate that the FDA did what it was supposed to do in this in this issue. Um, unfortunately, the case was brought um, to be sort of devoid of these facts and was issued in a very particular jurisdiction in Texas um, so that it would fall on one specific judge's desk. Um, this individual judge has a long history of anti-immigrant, anti-LGBTQ, anti-abortion uh, decisions. And so this is a very strategic political decision about where to pull this case, uh, place this case um, and, and what would happen. The, the options or, or what could happen as a result of this case candidly are very, very muddy. Um, it's really an, again, unprecedented uh, situation and that there has never been a case where there's so much evidence going into it that the FDA followed the appropriate procedural process. Um, and yet here we are still debating, uh, debating the merits of that process. Um, the judge could do everything from a full blown, um, you know, it's, it's completely taken off the market um, to a whole variety of lesser impacts. I think what is most important for folks to, to know in this period is that if mifepristone should go dark, right, should be either forbidden or, or very, um, very risky for providers to dispense given the, like, uh, the gray nature or the ambiguity of the ruling, um, abortion can still happen through um, a different medication route uh, using misopristone um, or we, what we call miso. Um, and so even if MIFI is taken off the market, medication abortions can still happen. Um, I think one of the things that we are adapting to is, is trying to predict, you know, crystal balling this case is, is really, really difficult. So um, the, the gray or the ambiguity of the case until it's actually decided um, is creating an environment where we are planning to do medical abortions without mifepristone at all. Um, and so if that is the ruling that comes out, Planned Parenthood here in New Jersey is prepared to, to find alternates and, and it is ready to provide alternate care to people seeking a medication abortion. Um, but this has, has really significant consequences beyond um, reproductive health and, and abortion access, because if this is allowed to, to stand and, and sort of happen, um, it could happen for any controversial um, medication, vaccine, um, device, you name it, that the FDA regulates. And so um, I could, you know, foresee a future in which, um, you know, the COVID vaccine, the HPV vaccine, hormone replacement therapies, a variety of different mental and behavioral health therapies, um, you know, it, it, it sort of becomes the wild west that if anybody can claim that the process that the FDA did was was unsatisfactory to them uh, and, and have this go to the, the courts, um, it can be really damning. Um, it is very likely that the FDA will push back um, on whatever the, you know, whatever the ruling is. Um, and therefore this case has the potential to go to the Supreme Court um, as early as this summer. And so again, a lot of this is still very much unknown. Um, we will be doing a, um, a Zoom and a conversation with folks um, when we have anything substantial to report on. So um, you can kind of stick with us uh, to get more information on this case. Um, sorry, my mouse keeps sort of freezing up on me. There we go. Um, some of the other things that I want to make sure that we're highlighting is the ways that we are trying to break down barriers and increase access um, to care for as many people as possible. Um, February was Black History Month. Uh, March is Women's History Month. And while Planned Parenthood is a reproductive um, 
healthcare organization and we don't sort of dive into reproductive justice issues all of the time. We're working in partnership with a whole host of organizations that do in fact do that work. Um, one of the coolest programs, um, there's a lot of cool programs under our umbrella, um, but one of them is called our Advocates Alliance in which we have received funds from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation to partner with um, very localized, community-driven, reproductive justice-based organizations that are tackling everything from clean water and lead issues in urban parts of New Jersey to, um, to a whole variety of, of issues as it relates to maternal and infant care in New Jersey. Um, and so we try to do as much as we can to raise up those voices and raise up those smaller community-based organizations into this larger orbit um, of, of both policy um, and practical service and direct service to, to patients. Um, and so that is, you know, it happens all of the time, but we've got some really, we have had and have done some really cool events uh, last month and, and into this month uh, in, in light of that sort of reproductive justice lens. Um, the other issues that we're working on is um, obviously affordability. So trying to remove cost sharing from abortion coverage in all insurance plans, which is a fancy way of saying, um, instead of having to hit your deductible or pay your out of pocket balance, um, you can uh, receive abortion care before those markers happen. And so for many people, depending on the type of plan they have, their deductible could be $5,000 a year um, that you have to hit you know, or before your insurance essentially kicks in. And so trying to address that um, for abortion care specifically. Um, last year, um, there was a change to Medicaid's supplemental prenatal program. Uh, the supplemental prenatal program was created to ensure that individuals who are ineligible for Medicaid, and that's typically due to immigration status, receive prenatal care. That program has been around for a very long time. Last year, it was expanded to include contraception. And so the idea being that again, if the idea, uh, the, the intent is to reduce unintended pregnancies, including contraceptive care uh, into that program is, is really important. We're continuing to work with the Department of Human Services and the Medicaid office, um, as well as many uh, stakeholders, New Jersey Policy Perspective, New Jersey Citizen Action, ACLU and others uh, to raise up adding abortion care into this supplemental program. The other issues that we're working on in terms of affordability um, is to make sure that there's increased funding for family planning uh, in, in this next year's budget, which, which we're debating right now. Um, continued investment in security training and facilities grants. Um, we are exploring our Medicaid reimbursement rates. Medicaid right now is uh, in the process of doing a total system rate review. Um, so everything from your cardiologist to your behavioral health to you name it. Um, and so one of the things that we have been pushing for is given the uh, intensity and sort of uptick in family planning and abortion care need in New Jersey um, to uh, address the reimbursement rates for those services um, earlier than this sort of larger global reimbursement rate analysis that they're doing. Um, Family planning uh, reimbursements are met with a nine to one federal match, which is which is really outstanding. So for every dollar the state spends, federal Medicaid spends nine on family planning services. Um, those rates were addressed in 2010 through statute. Um, there was a piece of legislation that called for equity in those rates, um, but haven't been touched in 13 years. Um, abortion is something that is only funded through our state's Medicaid program. There are no federal dollars allocated for abortion due to the Hyde Amendment, um, which has existed since 1976. Um, but the reimbursement rate here in New Jersey uh, for Medicaid for abortion care hasn't been touched in almost 40 years since the case law that prescribed that um, New Jersey's Medicaid program has to include abortion set the rates. Um, New Jersey would join uh, six other states if they increased their abortion reimbursement rate in, in its Medicaid program. As many states have come together and said, look, in the wake of the Dobbs decision, how can we ensure that providers are getting the most resources as possible from, um, from the Medicaid uh, beneficiaries that they're, that they're serving? 
Um, we continue to work um, with the BME to codify the expansion of scope of practice. So the scope of practice work that happened under the BME was under their authority. They have the authority to do it, um, but much like um, several different pieces that we've mentioned with Dobe, Department of Banking and Insurance and others, those are um, decisions that happen through the executive authority, meaning that the governor's office and the leadership in those agencies, you know, decide of their own volition to do this work and they're entitled to do that. Um, what codifying the expansion of scope of practice would do would ensure that in future administrations um, that the scope of practice can't be touched because it's embedded into state statute as opposed to a departmental or agency interpretation and uh, implementation. Um, one of the other things that I am um, always so proud of uh, in working for Planned Parenthood is the work that happens around uh, really addressing patients where they're at um, and knowing that so many individuals struggle with, with trauma um, and just have a lot of anxiety about uh, reproductive health care, right? Um, having a pap smear is, is, is unpleasant at best and can be traumatic at worst, depending on what a patient um, is walking in our doors with, right? And, and what their life has, has sort of dealt them. Um, so we have started using um, at Planned Parenthood of Northern, Central, and Southern New Jersey, uh, the large affiliate that covers 18 of 21 counties. Um, we have started using nitrous oxide, both in abortion procedures, as well as for any other reason that a patient will need um, additional support. And nitrous oxide you know, commonly is known as laughing gas. So you might have, have used this at your dentist's office. Um, and so what we have found is for individuals who um, have trauma or who are just really scared and worked up, right? Um, that using nitrous for pelvic exams, for blood draws, for IUD insertions or removals um, is really helping people to feel so much more at ease um, and just have a better experience so that they're not there just, just so tense and so worked up and so scared um, of, of receiving their medical care. Um, we have had several stories of individuals who said, I have put off coming in for this exam. Um, I have put off getting my IUD changed because it hurt so bad the first time. And I, it was just such a, an awful experience. And now, because I know that you all have this, this option for me, um, I'm able to, you know, sort of do the thing that I want to do and, and take matters into my own hands and, and get the care I want um, because I'm not so worried about the pain. And so this is something that I'm really proud of um, this affiliate in particular for doing and is one of the uh, national sort of leaders in bringing nitrous into the reproductive um, reproductive health space to address things beyond terminations um, that can be unpleasant or uncomfortable or filled with sort of anxiety. Um, and then the last thing that we're doing um, is, is really pivotal as it relates to the movement of individuals from around the country who are coming to New Jersey for abortion care. Um, our Elizabeth Health Center, again, this is Planned Parenthood of Northern, Central, and Southern New Jersey, um, has expanded its hours and additionally expanded its scope of services to include procedural uh, or in-clinic abortion. Um, the hours are now uh, Friday nights. Our last patient, I believe, is at 9 p.m. Uh, and next week are rolling out uh, Thursday nights as well. And, and the mindset around that um, is how to make care more accessible for people. Um, we also have, uh, I believe, eight health centers around the state, maybe even more, um, who are expanding their hours into Saturday mornings um, through Saturday afternoons as well. Um, Elizabeth in particular, I call out um, because it is, um, you know, less than a, a mile more or less from, from Newark International Airport. And so for individuals that are coming from out of state, being able to provide uh, procedural abortions that close to the airport is, is a really big benefit um, for, for, you know, for those individuals who, who are coming here to New Jersey. Oops. Um, so in the 
state fiscal year 24 budget, um, Governor Murphy has already proposed his budget. Um, all of the funds from last year are included in it. And so one of the things that we will continue to do uh, is to work with the legislature to ensure that those funds remain throughout the, the spring months of the budget uh, negotiation process. So um, we had a very um, you know, positive start to, to this endeavor and that it was already included in the governor's budget. Uh, and we would look forward to speaking with legislators and articulating the, the benefits of this care um, and these funds. Um, one of the things that, that we have talked about for many years and, and we have seen the impacts of um, during the Christie years when the funding was cut is that um, not only do we expect there to be an uptick in STIs and STDs when services are diminished for patients, um, but we also know that there are financial impacts to the state as well as to the individual when care is delayed or withheld. And so um, we have talked sort of broadly, um, you know, I've mentioned the, the maternal and infant health issues uh, that First Lady Tammy Murphy has championed. Um, in so many instances, you know, treating STDs and STIs is a lot of the preconception engagement that needs to happen, right? If your fertility is impacted because of unchecked or untreated um, STIs or STDs, there's a real impact to your long-term health and your ability to have, have a family when you want to. Um, and so we are just really pleased to see the attention continuing to be on how to provide as much care as possible to as many of, as I've mentioned, the, the vulnerable patients that we serve every day. Um, so how do we get here? Um, taking action is always really important. I've included um, all of our digital channels, um, Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter. Uh, on behalf of Planned Parenthood Action Fund of New Jersey. Um, we are also on Facebook and LinkedIn. Um, I should mention, uh, you know, the Action Fund is the political and policy arm that represents the two affiliates in the state. Um, and so there's also ways for you to engage directly with the two affiliates that cover the, cover the state of New Jersey. Um, all told, there are 21 physical health centers as well as a virtual telehealth center um, that operate in the state. But um, from a policy and politics perspective, which is the purpose of this call, um, these handles are where you can best engage with those efforts. Um, I want to raise up, it is an important year. Um, every year in New Jersey is an election year, um, but this year is, is important in that it is our entire legislative body, all 120 members are up for election. Um, to date, 22 incumbents are not seeking re-election in their existing seats. Um, and that is in many ways due to the redistricting process that happens every 10 years. Um, and so in some instances, you now see um, members who were essentially shoehorned into a district which would have now two senators. And so um, some are electing to uh, retire and not fight a primary fight for that Senate seat. Um, we're also seeing sort of the inverse happen where um, when two senators wind up in one district, it means there's no senator in another. So there are several members of the assembly that are running, uh, quote unquote, running up into the Senate for, for Senate seats. Um, and then there's also just some straight up retirements and folks who are electing to um, either for, for health reasons or for family reasons or just not seeking reelection. And so um, this is an incredibly important race. Um, you know, so much of what has happened, and I think just by evidence of, of our conversation, um, has been at the local level in, in the wake of Dobbs. And so who represents us in Trenton, uh, who our legislators are, who our governor is, um, plays a very significant role now more so than ever when it comes to reproductive health. Um, and so, you know, this is this will be the first year um, that we see all of our legislature up uh, since since that decision and since the sort of turn. Um, we also obviously have local races. Um, 2024 will bring about our presidential race as well as um, Congress and one of our senators. And then 2025 will be our gubernatorial election, which again will be uh, incredibly important. Governor Murphy is uh, term limited, um, so he cannot run again. Uh, and so there will be um, an active primary, I'm assuming on, on both sides of the aisle uh, in 2025 to, to seek that seat. Um, for our next state governor. 
Um, we will be engaging in a variety of different ways to help engage the electorate. Um, Planned Parenthood Action Fund of New Jersey is a 501c4, so we can engage in, in a variety of both lobbying and electoral activity. Um, we also have a, a small PAC, Planned Parenthood Votes New Jersey, um, and we'll, we'll, we will be doing our part to engage, um, you know, engage the public, engage voters uh, in, in these races and, and the importance of them given uh, what is going on in the world. Um, these are just some quick uh, deadlines for folks to be aware of um, and want to call um, into um, uh, call to your attention the newest version of voting that the state has. And so you can vote in person on election day at the ballot box, as, as many of you might have done for, for years, if not decades. Um, you can vote by mail, which many people uh, began to do during the pandemic and, and continue to do. Um, but we now allow for early voting. And so from October 28th until November 5th of this year, there are early voting periods. And so you can elect to go to these very specific locations um, to vote early uh, in the elections. And so I want to just uh, make time now. I'm going to stop sharing my screen so I can see all of your smiling faces um, and would love to take any Q&A. And again, we will share this deck through Jeff and he can distribute it. Thanks so much, Jackie. Uh, it was really great presentation and uh, some uh, really great information that you were able to share. Uh, we do have some time left for Q&A. So if you have Questions for Jackie, uh, feel free to raise your Zoom hand and we'll ask you to unmute or you can put your question in the chat. Uh, while we're waiting for a couple of questions to come in, I just want to bring up one of the points you mentioned again earlier in the presentation, uh, which was the protections for providers uh, that we have in New Jersey uh, and the, uh, the extradition protections. And uh, just really wanted to uh, to drill down on that a little bit more. So, uh, sorry about the background noise. Um, so, with with regard to mental health providers in particular, so if 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 a if a social worker or other mental health provider was was providing guidance to a client uh, about abortion uh, options, um, that person would still be protected in New Jersey uh, and able to do that, even if the person that they're providing the support to us from another state, is that accurate? Um, so I can't speak to the licensing provision of that. So uh, can you provide counseling care or, or you know, behavioral health care to someone who is not living in New Jersey? That's a little bit afoul of kind of my lane, um, but procedurally, yes. If you are engaging with somebody or you're speaking with somebody um, and you're talking about abortion care, um, your, your client records, your, you know, any, any material that you have to that effect, um, you cannot be subpoenaed, you cannot be requested to be engaged in, uh, in cases, um, as it relates to abortion or any of the provisions therein. Now, if there is an issue where, um, let's say an individual, I don't know, does something else nefarious or, or dangerous or, or problematic, that doesn't, excuse that from being from being put forward. So if somebody commits a, a crime or something and there's a, a case that's beyond and apart, um, that's different. It's only the protections around uh, these abortion provisions. Yeah, and, and to speak to the licensing issue, you're right. You, um, the licensing issue depends on, on where you're licensed and where you're treating the client. But there are, I know there are a number of, of social workers who carry licenses in multiple states so that they can see clients in those states. And also we are moving towards passing, uh, hopefully, the interstate licensing compact for social workers, uh, which would again have its own set of, of rules and regulations. Uh, but it, it's good to know that practitioners in New Jersey are, are protected. Uh, they choose to, to provide advice to their clients. Um, Victoria is asking if you can describe the kind of training clinicians would receive as part of the funding you mentioned. Yeah, thanks so much, Victoria. That's a great question. Um, so in this first year, uh, the funds have been awarded primarily to Rutgers University. Um, and um, forgive me for not knowing the behemoth that is Rutgers, which, which parts of Rutgers is getting it. But essentially, the, the mindset is, 
uh, the first step in, in all of this is to create the training um, uh, rubric and the, and the methodology and the, the sort of curriculum and all of that. Um, one way I have expressed it to folks is um, who have been asking like, can, can we send our midwives up? Can we send our advanced practice nurses up to get trained in providing abortions now that the state allows for it, right? Um, in many ways, there is not an established a plan and curriculum. And so step one, Rutgers is tasked with sort of laying that groundwork. And, and the way I've sort of uh, talked about it in very layman's terms, you can't give somebody a scholarship to a university that doesn't exist. And so in this first year, Rutgers is really sort of tasked with sort of creating the rules of the road, right? Like what are the standards? How are we doing it? How many field hours are required? Um, one of the big questions that we have is, how many field hours are required for an established provider, somebody who has seen their way around a cervix a million times, right, versus somebody who is brand new to practicing and really ensuring that um, that sort of intentionality about teaching somebody from, from sort of the, the ground level versus taking somebody who has been practicing for a very long time and now just is sort of expanding their scope of practice um, likely requires way different uh, training than and, and even clinical hours than um, is prescribed. So I think what um, a lot of providers are looking for is this second year, hopefully, in, in fiscal 24 budget, um, wherein funds, I imagine, would be allocated to, okay, here are providers, you can go and, and send your folks over to get trained up now that Rutgers has, uh, has this system in place. And so one of the big... Um, one of the big things that we have talked about a lot as providers is how to create the space um, for the inter individual to go receive this training, but then what are the impacts to providing care in the clinical setting? Essentially, how do, how do uh, providers you know, bring in the per diems and all of the other support staff if you're taking people and saying, all right, for the next X amount of weeks, you're gonna be practicing and doing your field work so that you can come back certified um, and trained up in, in abortion procedures. And so that's a lot of what I think many of us are looking to year two to hopefully you know, deepen and, and better understand. But um, I know it's not a, a ton of information uh, right now, but again, it's sort of that you, you can't get a scholarship to a school that doesn't exist yet. And so I think this first year is really getting, uh, getting the rules of the road laid out. Thanks. No uh, we do have a couple of minutes left. Any other questions uh, for Jackie? You can put them in the chat or raise your hand. Um, I did put my email in the chat as well. So um, it's in the deck. Uh, so if anybody has questions after the fact, you can always reach out um, and get a hold of me that way too. If uh, people want to receive updates and actions alert, action alerts from Planned Parenthood and the Action Fund, um, where should they go to sign up for those? Yeah, so um, our website is just PP Action NJ. I will put it in the um, uh, pbactionnj.org. Um, so that website is our, our sort of home base. You can find all of um, how to sign up for emails, how to get involved with us in all of our digital channels. Um, but that is the, the spot to go. Um, we post events there. Um, I should note that, you know, a big part of our work, especially now that COVID is, is sort of, not behind us, but it's it's uh, lessened its impact, um, is getting together in community again, right? And having events, having, whether that's postcard writing campaigns, um, there's a trivia night later this month that's more of just like a fun event. Um, so really just trying to make sure that there are spaces and environments throughout the state of New Jersey where people can come together uh, and sort of you know, break bread, share a drink, um, and, and talk about reproductive health broadly and, and engage. Um, there's also uh, obviously always fundraising opportunities to engage with our work. Um, as I mentioned, you know, we, um, or I think I mentioned, we never turn anyone away, regardless of their ability to pay. Um, and unfortunately, because of both the influx of out of state patients, as well as just sort of the financial, you know, the economic realities of the day, um, our uncompensated care uh you know fund is is getting pulled at you know incredibly dramatically i mean we're seeing millions of dollars a year uh in uncompensated care because 
it's our belief that we we don't turn anyone away no matter what. And so um, we can always use the support and the resources from uh, supporters and donors to engage in that work too. Thanks, Jackie. Uh, one other thing I was wondering, just as we wrap up, you had just mentioned uh, out of state influx. Um, do you have a sense for you know how many people now are coming into New Jersey from other states that have been banned from abortion access in their home state? Yeah, um, it's hard to put a numerical number to it, and and the reason is that we have found that um, many individuals are coming to New Jersey and staying with friends or family and are putting the address of that person, right, who they're staying with on their intake form. And it isn't until the clinician is, you know, in the exam room discussing aftercare, discussing coming back for their next appointment, that the person verbally acknowledges that they're, they're, they're not from New Jersey, that they don't actually live here. Um, I think that we have seen an, um, an incredible amount of fear um, and uh, as I mentioned, you know, there's already the first case in Texas where an ex-husband is, is filing against his ex-wife and, and three of her friends. And so um, it's hard for us to have a number because there is a lot of, um, you know, inconsistencies in what individuals are, are sharing and, and putting on their forms. Um, but what I can say is that 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 level or sort of that that mindset around a fear-based approach to healthcare um, will unfortunately have rippling effects for years, if not decades from now. Um, we already know that there are such, you know, dramatic and dire uh, biases as it relates to women of color receiving healthcare to begin with. Um, and unfortunately, I think this moment is only exacerbating uh, that mistrust in, in providers um, or, or mistrust broadly. Um, and, and I think that that is, you know, so the reality that we're faced with right now. Jackie, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, it was really great information and I hope that those on the call will follow up and, uh, and keep in touch with, uh, with the Planned Parenthood Action Fund so we can stay, uh, up to date on what's going on and get involved in advocacy campaigns and NASW New Jersey will continue to share information and, and work closely with, with Jackie and other folks, uh, working in the reproductive justice realm to, uh, uh, to make sure that social workers can stay engaged and so that we can, uh, you know, we can support uh, the care that our clients need. Um, so thank you again, all everybody uh, for being here and uh, we will see you at our next community conversation. Thanks everyone. Thank you so much. And thanks for all the work you do every day. Really appreciate it. Take thanks, care. Jackie. Take care.